don't know, probably one. Uh, I've known John. Uh, I did one of them. Jay, I, I, Jay I think you have a terrible connection right now. Is that just me? No, nope. you, you have a terrible connection, Jay. <laughs> Any better? Yeah, a little. That's iconic. Mm. Is that any better or no? Yeah, a little bit better right there. A little bit. All right. Let me uh, see if I can make that quick. So anyway, I've known John for a while. Um, uh, I appreciate you putting this together for us, John. Uh, I've known John since he was a young coach. And... Um, and then now as a, a physical therapist and running uh, uh, Feldman's Physical Therapy, you know, at a gold gym in Fishkill, he's been, um, he's been able to, we've been able to work together. He's worked with a lot of my players and uh, just been an outstanding uh, relationship and lecture series. Um, you know, it's been great. So, John, thank you so much for bringing what you guys have to say tonight sounds good uh you know i, I appreciate that jay as always you uh you're very kind with your introductions uh i have a lot of fun doing this and i, I definitely want to thank you guys as a club for letting us pop in tonight um jeff and jess um i, I already said it once but i definitely owe you guys big time for this uh i know it's past getting close to both your bedtimes <laughs> And so, um, you know, I will just make a small introduction to everybody. Uh, first and foremost, you know, Jeff uh, and Jess are, are friends and colleagues of mine. Uh, I use them both, um, you know, weekly in, in my practice. Uh, Jeff is a uh, massage therapist, former one of the head trainers here at Gold's Gym, Dutchess County, um, and then has, has transitioned into an excellent resource for myself, I know, on a weekly basis, helping me with my mental outlook on life. Uh, Jess is a phenomenal uh, clinician as well, uh, and I can say wholeheartedly, and it's not often I get to do this, but I've used them both in my own family and my circle of friends. I see their value, and this topic tonight was uh, an easy one to fill with, um, you know, with, with both of their suggestions. So I really do thank, you know, thank them for their time. And I don't have much to offer on this topic other than a slight introduction into how important, uh, you know, mental and psychological fortitude is. Uh, it's paramount when it comes to to life in general. Uh, there's a hierarchy when when managing stress and, and injury and and any kind of hurdles to wellness in your in your body. And stress is always at the top. Um, so this is a common theme that I see a lot of athletes go through and, and youth athletes especially. And one thing is for sure, all of the top athletes. Uh, have phenomenal mental fortitude and even more so preparedness. And you can't have mental fortitude without proper preparedness. And that's what I really thought Jeff and Jess could shine tonight. Um, so that's what tonight's about is highlighting the importance in, in managing stress in your life uh, at your age. You have your social stresses, your uh, physical stresses from growth and development. You have uh, your family stresses. You have sport, you know, athletics. You have stresses from every part of your your life and you know in your ecosystem and you may not even recognize it as stress and that's one of the issues is that even good stress can be stressful in the system and it affect your life and your body physically and your ability to handle all situations in your day-to-day -day life um and this is a topic that used to be very taboo um you know can't talk about mental health and you know uh oh, you need you know you psychologically you know you're weaker and, and you know those are, are really important um do I admit this person? Somebody else does. Okay, good. I do. I'm not a uh, You know, it, it's unfortunate that those used to be the, you know, the, the buzz phrases around that. But um, talking as somebody who has played my whole life, you know, I started touching the ball when I was three. I was fortunate to play through Division One, a little semi-pro, and then coaching now. In college, I had massive hurdles my freshman year, and I was told that I needed to speak to a sports psychologist. I was in my own head. I let my coach get in my head, some of my teammates, and I was struggling. 
And back then I felt like I was like, oh, really? Like I felt like, you know, that cartoon of somebody kind of curled up in a ball in, you know, in the, in the shadow in the corner of his room. And I just, I had no way out. And thankfully today, there are so many more avenues for, for youth athletes, um, you know, older athletes, uh, and, and even, you know, everybody in their day-to-day -day life. So, you know, this is something that I thought would be excellent, um, you know, for, you know, my colleagues here to talk about. And, you know, so without taking up any more, any more time, I want to let them get right into it. But as somebody who has seen sports evolve from when I was younger to the demands of today's sports and your practice schedules and your competition levels, and then your academics as well. And then, you know, college preparation is starting earlier and earlier now. It's just, we're seeing, and I know Jess and Jeff can, um, you know, we'll can agree with this. You're just seeing stresses and pressures at such an earlier and earlier age for youth. And your job is to be a youth athlete. A, you know, when, when I have somebody fill out their occupation on my form and they're in school, student, that's your occupation. Your job is to be young. Your job is to experience all that life has to offer right now with minimal stresses, because we promise you that your stresses are gonna be there no matter what, when you get older. So we wanna help you manage, recognize symptoms and, and give you some tools to succeed where you are now, because that's gonna make you a better person and at the end of the day, a better athlete. Because let's be honest, that's what we're here talking about. This is Manhattan Soccer Club. You know, we're talking about an elite level, you know, soccer club here, and we want you to feel well prepared. So um, in terms of dealing with a hierarchy of needs for an individual, stress is always number one. I have people come in and say, yeah, you know, I've been trying to, I've been dealing with this. I got a new pair of shoes. I got some massage gun. I tried to rub this oil on there, or, you know, I, you know, jumped on a pogo stick and said my, you know, Hail Marys and whatever it might be. You know, we tend to focus on some small details and minutia that may have minimal return on investment. When the first thing I ask people is, hang on, let's let's talk about life. How you, what do you what you know, do you have any stresses in your life, good or bad? You know, how are you sleeping? What's what are your nutrition habits like? Basically taking a look at what is affecting your body. Are you putting your body in a position to help heal itself? So forget about everything else for a moment. I want to let, you know, Jess and and Jeff kind of take the reins here and offer what you know they have for you. Um, because I know it's invaluable. And I really, guys, I, I thank you so much for this. Um, you know, Jess, I'll let you go first. I think you won the uh, rock, paper, scissors there. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. And thanks for the introduction. Um, I know that I sent over my bio, but like John said, I mean, I've spent um, probably 30 years at this point as an, as an athlete, um, an academic, you know, athlete, and now post academics and into um adulthood and parenthood um but sports and competition and activity and motion have always been a really big part of my life and you know doing a lot of this research working with a lot of different people we we find why athletics and sports and camaraderie are so important to us as as individuals and human beings because we're not meant to be isolated or just individuals um, and so sometimes that's good and bad, and there's a lot that's connected to that. And John, I wrote a note down when you said like your ecosystem, I think that's such a great way to describe like our lives as a whole, you know, we're kind of under this umbrella and all these things are um, constantly just interconnected. And I think Jeff can talk about the same thing. I mean, we kind of went back and forth on little things that we might talk about, but I feel like we all have strengths and weaknesses in some areas and they're always overlapping and they're always um one is impacting the other so mental and emotional stress is going to impact physical um success really and i took some notes and i wrote some things down but a lot of what i would speak to at this point is really where i see people struggling with balance um and the ability to balance their academic pressures, their social pressures, their athletic pressures, their parental pressures. Um, and that's a really, really big component um, of excelling in any one of those areas. So when you wanna be a good friend or you wanna be a good partner or you wanna be a good student or you wanna be a good child, um, really, really can't work on all of those things at once if you're only focusing on one and only one. Um, and that's pretty much why when we break these things down, um, one of the things that I want to highlight is basically how we look at any stressors or any issues that we might be having in one of those areas and breaking them down into almost smaller manageable pieces to really see, to your point, um, when we have fatigue or when we have a problem or when we have something that's causing us pain, how and where is it coming from? And that's a really big piece, but we can't look at it from as a whole. We have to break it down into smaller pieces 
um, to really see where the fatigue is coming from, where is the burnout coming from, why are we not excelling in one of these areas. So as, you know, excellent athletes, um, I'm sure that usually ranks really, really high in what your priority list is. But like John said, there's a lot of components to who you are as an individual that I don't think we can ever necessarily discredit. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to just really spend a little bit of time talking about um, almost the reasons why some of this stuff can become so overwhelming where we see um, athletes decide to no longer participate and really what drives them to do that. Um, and one of the things that in my own research, in my own experience, it stops being fun. It stops being something that in, is proving enjoyment or bringing joy into someone's life. And it becomes extremely overwhelming and extremely competitive and extremely stressful. So the goal of today is to give you guys some strategies on how to find balance in that and manage it. But that has to be at the end of the day, the number one component of what you're remembering when you're doing whatever it is you're doing. Am I enjoying this? Is this really something that's providing something to my life? Um, and I think that we talk about that with friends. We talk about that with classes that we might be taking. We talk about with whatever we're participating in. Is this a benefit or is this a cost? Um, so I think understanding pressures and where that comes from, John was um, kind of on point when he talked about good stress and bad stress. And good stress is absolutely a motivator. We need stress to keep ourselves safe. Um, it's how our body regulates things. You know, when we think of stress in terms of being hot or cold, that's how we decide if we need a drink of water or we need um, shelter or clothing to keep us safe. Um, if we're at risk in some way, shape or form, the stress uh, helps us fight or flight. If we're, we don't ever have stress and we're not ever going to really be able to be safe. Um, so there are elements where stress is actually really good and motivating us to be better, be stronger, be faster. Um, but when that stress becomes chronic, this is where we find people succumbing to different types of injuries. Um, we can talk about gut and inflammation, and I know Jeff is going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, stomach issues, inflammation in joints, inflammation in um, just how your, your overall functioning is, the clarity that you would have in your brain and your thoughts. Um, and especially in the teenage years, this is what comes out as acne. It can come out as hair loss. It can come out as weight gain. It can come out as weight loss. So there's a lot of different things physically that stress and chronic stress um, plays a part in. Also, the thing that I don't think is touched on a lot is mood. Disrupted or inconsistent mood is a really big piece of what happens when chronic stress is a factor. And this is angry, short-tempered, getting annoyed easily at small things, whether it's yourself and your capabilities or someone else. Um, and so you may not even see that all the time, but this is something that a lot of the times your peers or your coaches or your parents might see, and they might not know how to approach it necessarily. So I think this is a, a bigger kind of component in terms of asking for help. And I think a lot of times the barrier is that we're not noticing or athletes are not noticing when things are becoming overwhelming. Um, and that kind of has to be something about, again, our ecosystem and finding balance of being preventive with a lot of this stuff and building in strategies and structure that does not push us over the limit. Um, so I think we all really know the, the health and uh, physical and emotional benefits of sports and teamwork. It reduces obesity, heart, heart issues, diabetes, it improves muscle strength and physical cap capabilities. You have peer support and friendship. It can improve self-esteem and confidence. Um, but one of the biggest things that I like to talk to people about too is goals. And what are the goals of participating in something like this? What is it gonna provide you now? What are you looking to, for it to provide you in the future? How do we help you get there? So we as your support system, your parents, your coaches, your friends, your teachers and your peers, um, that's a really, really big thing in learning how to be successful because it also means sometimes dialing back when we know that something is too, too much or too hard or it's getting too much of our energy, we have to understand where the goals fit in. Um, but the physical and emotional energy that you're giving to any of these components always has to be like assessed and reassessed a million times over. Uh, we have to understand why we're doing what we're doing. So I think that also building in some stress relievers are really really good ideas. Um, and I'm not sure what happens with this club if there are 
conversations that happen um, in this elite group. But I also think as much as talking to your teammates is important, finding support outside of your sport is really important. Um, this is peers, this is friends outside of your sport, this is teachers, this is family. Um, you need people that aren't necessarily in this circle to be able to talk to about the things that are going on. They don't have to understand the pressure that that it's providing, but it's important to have people outside of that where you can really kind of take off any mask that you have um, and be pretty vulnerable to share some of the things that are difficult. Um, so building connections with peers, I really like when people journal and write things down, even if it's a little note on your phone, the, the notes apps are great now. And I know that there's a lot of new apps that just allow us to kind of have that and have access to that all the time. Um, having a therapist, obviously, or a counselor or a coach or someone that you're checking in with to help identify those moments where you're stuck and how we can build out of them. Um, and really surrounding yourself with positive people. This is friendships. This is people that are influential. It doesn't have to be peers, but it has to be people that understand your goals and are helping you get there. Um, and they might not always be specific to the sport. You know, they're specific to you as a person and your person as a whole. Um, and so part of this, too, is I think identifying who you want to look like outside of your sport and how the sport fits into who you are as a person, um, which are some things that I think, you know, we don't spend a lot of time about, especially at this age group. Um, we're not spending a lot of time talking about who they are and who they want to become. Um, and as a therapist working with mostly adults at this point, um, that's a big thing that I talk a lot about with people is how they didn't have the opportunity to really sit back and think about their goals and what they wanted to do. So that's probably one of the biggest things that I would suggest making sure that you're constantly focusing on refocusing, having conversations about trying new things. Um, and I just, I don't know how much time any of you have to be able to do these extra things, but I really think it's important to find the balance to make sure that you're giving yourself the opportunity to be well-rounded and to find the balance and making sure that you have time for all of these things because as you age and as you grow and as your sport continues to become the main priority, where are you finding time for these other things that might be just as important for you? Um, and that would be where you know, I think finding the balance helps alleviate some of the stress where we're not feeling guilty, we're not feeling burdened by um, the lack of our participation in certain things. FOMO, for an example, you know, if we're participating in our sport, but we're missing out on social activities, how are you finding balance in that? How are you reconnecting with those peers that might not be on your team? So here are examples of just how um, it really is important to make sure that you're checking into the whole person that is yourself. So this is sleep, this is eating, this is school, this is academics, this is leisure, this is fun, um, in addition to your sport, which seems like immeasurable at this point, I think for a lot of people, but it really is about how we can um, recharge and refuel um, and recover. And so I know Jeff was gonna talk a lot about like kind of the physicality of some of this stuff and what that really looks like. So I'm going to let you take over and then I'll just chime in if there's some spots that uh, I feel like I can add. Perfect. Uh, that was great. You had uh, you touched on a lot of things that got my wheel spinning, so I made a few extra notes. But as John and I talk about all the time, he and I could rattle off for quite some time. I, I don't want to take up too long. So I'll start by saying thank you. Um, I know, John, you, you kind of joke around that you owe us, but I'm grateful to be here. Listening to Jessica right there was absolutely worth my time already. So hopefully I can contribute something similar. Um, I'll start by saying from a credential standpoint, you know, on a, a mental health status, you know, I don't necessarily have credentials for it. Jessica being here is definitely invaluable to all of us. Um, but what I do bring to the table is as a 42 year old man that's played sports my whole life and that now has three kids, two of which are playing sports as well, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely given me a slightly different dynamic and my wife actually still plays soccer as well. So that's a whole lot of fun and, and certainly applies to this group. Um, being able to watch her get out there playing herself as well as coaching, it, it gives me a little more of a, uh, an appreciation even, you know, those of you kids playing now, maybe feeling like that pressure is on that it has to happen right now, even if it doesn't get to the ultimate level you want it to get to 
you're going to still have opportunities to keep playing. And, you know, as Jessica was saying, it's, it's kind of a matter of finding that balance of things and finding um, what degree you want to get to, setting your goals, knowing how hard you want to, to work and get there. So without rattling too, too much and rambling there, I'll start by saying I've, I've got a couple of notes put down. I'll, I'll touch upon each of these and probably tell a few stories of my experience as well. But when we talk about mental health, what comes to mind for me personally, the first thing is our nutrition. And that's probably not the first thing that many people think about. But what we now know is there is a direct line of communication between the gut and the brain. We know this as the gut brain axis. And what we deal with, unfortunately, in the States, especially is 60% of our standard American diet is ultra processed foods. And those foods aren't really nutritious. They're not really things that are intended to fuel our gut and fuel our body. They're, they taste great and they're cheap and we can buy them wherever we want to go and they can sit on a, a shelf somewhere for God knows how long because of the preservatives put in there. But what that does to our gut is it destroys it. We're entire, consuming entirely too many sugars, entirely too many what are called polyunsaturated fatty acids, and these just destroy us from the inside out. We talk about the stressors that John and Jessica both rattled off. There are so many stressors in our life whether it's you know getting in a fight with somebody, having homework to do, having to get to practice, whatever it may be along those lines. But what we don't think about as much is what we're consuming. There's some environmental stressors, toxins and so on, but a lot of what we're putting into our mouths as opposed to being nourishing and helping us, they're actually really negatively impacting us. So when we have an unhealthy gut, we end up getting what they call leaky gut. And there's, there's a, a multitude of different things that will lead to this. I won't go too, too far down that. But consuming a lot of the sugars and these poor fats, these industrial seed oils, are actually creating these gaps in the gut that are allowing all sorts of inflammatory components to get out of the gut and into the system that they're not supposed to be in and from the system into the gut where they're not supposed to be. And as soon as we start kind of messing with that communication pathway between the gut and the brain, mental health disorders, a, a, a plenty start to arise. So my recommendation there, I, I don't want to just highlight a lot of negative things. I want to try to give some, some action strategies is enjoy your food for sure, but try to enjoy whole foods as much as possible. I love the 80-20 rule. I like to say 80% of the time be consuming whole foods. And then 20% of the time, I like to recommend go for minimally processed foods. So those are foods that have five or less ingredients. Ultra processed foods have five or more. And that is literally what we have about 60% of in our standard American diet. So Sadly, it doesn't come as any surprise that we see just as much mental health disorder as we do because we are so overfed and undernourished. So nutrition is a vital, vital component. And these are things, each of these topics, I, I came up with three specifics that I wanted to talk about. And these are three things that have impacted me directly, personally, but also areas that I've really put some time and effort in to learn a little more about so I can change it for myself and I've had the opportunity to help quite a few clients and friends and family members over the years with these things. So without beating that one too, too much, just be super mindful about what it is you're eating. Think of what you're consuming as more than just fuel. It's information for your body and every single cell in your body is constantly changing, constantly being rebuilt. And we have dynamic tissue in our body. So we want to think about what I'm eating is actually going to become a part of my body at some point. And I want to really make sure I'm getting those those nutrient dense foods in that maybe they're not going to initially taste as good as that thing out of the box and out of the package because it doesn't have the sugar, salt, fat that, that we're seeing in those things. But we it, it usually takes about a two week window if you literally are at a point that you are addicted to those foods and you're, you're really your taste buds are telling you you need them give yourself that commitment to the two weeks and i swear within a two-week window you're going to start to enjoy the flavors of whole foods fruits vegetables depending on the, the sources of proteins you get some eggs some beef ch chicken so on and so forth so highly recommend that um still along that same topic but 
less about the food now more about hydration water is a vital component too but more than water and john and i have talked about this in the, the office a couple of times is the electrolytes now because as soccer players you guys are running all over the place you're sweating out so much more than water you can get away with things like the gatorades and so on but all the different food colorings in there the dyes and such those are also irritating the gut so i usually recommend looking at some sort of an electrolyte packet that's actually going to allow your body to absorb the fluids that you're taking a little, a little bit better so with the nutrition and the hydration out of the way that's really going to start to play a massive role on cutting back on the level of the physical stressors that play in your sport is going to have on you and that let's be honest here we are it's a little after nine o'clock on a school night sleep is a vital piece of this too so we have to be mindful of these later nights with practice and then are we eating when we get home after practice or are we eating before practice if we eat and then we go to bed well now your body doesn't have the opportunity to repair it's now digesting still so we're missing out the boat there too so that's a hard one and i'm, I'm not going to be overly strict on that but i would highly recommend if the family can work around it trying to consume the meals before we get home so we're not getting home at nine or, or whatever time it is after practice and then just eating a, a meal and rushing to bed or rushing to get homework done and then get to bed you know that sleep component is a a vital piece of it so i'll stop there with the nutrition for now but i'll be happy if at the end we do a q a or if anybody has uh any specific questions for me at some point john we can give out my email to to delve into that a little bit more yeah. um a quick inner you know interjection you know i mm -hmm. i get questions on nutrition uh, a lot I don't go down that route because I'm not nearly well as well versed in that in that realm as a lot of other people, yourself included. For the club, uh, Jay Eddie, anytime people ask me about nutrition, I always defer to Jeff. He's my go-to. He's helped me in the past. I just don't even touch that. Um, so I, I can, you know, not just a plug for himself, but um, you know, I, I, I can recommend that's that's a whole different topic in and of itself. Um, you know, I think would be would be great, but um, you know, cannot speak highly enough about him. And Jeff would be a great resource, you know, on the nutrition aspect. I'd be happy to. But, I didn't follow it, but yeah. he led me down the right path. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. You're still young enough. You can get away with it for now, for a, a little bit longer, anyway. You, you hear that, Jay? I'm still young. <laughs> All right, so next we'll transition into the next big thing that I find is mindset. This is something that I'm going to share with you some of my past here, but this is from a book from, oh, uh, Jess, you might be able to help me here. Carol Dweck wrote the book Mindset, um, and she delves into this quite a bit, but I keep it really simple. What she's talking about is the difference between having a fixed mindset and having a growth mindset. Mindset is such a vital component here of mental health in general, of all these stressors and so on. But the difference between a fixed and a growth mindset is simply with a fixed mindset. You think that you're born the way you are, you have a skill set, and you can top out at that skill set. And once you do, and everybody starts to pass you, well, you're done and you might as well give up. You're not good enough. And the growth mindset shows you that, you know what? we can work at this we can put in the time and effort that's why you know the whole ten thousand hour rule for somebody to become a real expert and get to a real elite level they've devoted the time and effort to get in ten thousand hours of doing something and not just doing it but doing it really well so they get better and better and better this was really impactful for me because i was an athlete from out of the womb and i still in some capacity am but as a child, I definitively had a fixed mindset. And I, I was fortunate, I had an older brother, I had three older cousins, my uncle, got to watch all of them playing sports ahead of me. So I kind of had that built-in lesson that I was getting just by watching them. But I didn't practice on my own, I didn't put in the time and effort on my own outside of in-season practice. And as a result, early on, because I knew my sport, I knew what I was doing, I was a, a few steps ahead of my peers and it was great. I had a blast with that. It definitely fed my ego and I was one of the better players on my team, specifically football, but a lot of the guys caught up to me. A lot of the guys got in the weight room way before I did and they blew past me and having a fixed mindset, that stress was something I couldn't overcome 
And I just realized at a pretty young age that, all right, I guess I wasn't cut out for this the way that I thought I was. And, you know, I, I thought I played this role of the hero, scoring the touchdowns, playing, making the big plays, doing all these things that just came natural so that when it got to the point that everyone was catching up and, and passing me and having that fixed mindset, I literally just gave up. So that gets me thinking about a couple of different things here is for you guys, I want you to work towards understanding the difference between the, the two of those, first of all, but then really challenge yourself to have that growth mindset. Recognize that no matter how good you are now, if you're if you desire to be better and you put in the time and effort, you make that a priority, you can continue to get better without question. Um, growth mindset is is true in all capacities, I, I think athletics for sure, academics for sure, relationship building. There's so many areas that we can think about the benefits of having a growth mindset and not uh, giving up on ourselves. Um, but I mentioned a moment ago as well, um, the role that I played on the team. And John and I had this conversation in the office the other day, I shared with him, um, over the years I've gotten a couple of pretty cool uh, nicknames that clients and friends have given me. And it's showing me that I've I've hit this transition phase of life and I, I actually embrace it rather than getting offended by it. When I was younger, I would think of my role as being the hero, being the, the main character in a movie, if you will. And I've been given the nicknames Yoda, mm -hmm. Mickey from Rocky, the trainer, and Morpheus from The Matrix. So rather than being the main character and being that hero role, I've been somebody who, through my experience in life, through sports especially, I hit my peak pretty early because of that fixed mindset, but through not giving up and through doing the work on my own and recognizing what my flaws were, I've now cultivated a skill set that I can share with other people. And I especially like to share it with youth because I want to help make, make sure that nobody makes the same mistake that I made. And I know I'm not going to be able to impact everybody, but if I can share this story and I can get you guys to think just a little bit and recognize that having a growth mindset and thinking, what is my role? What is it that I want to do? Not everybody is necessarily going to be the hero, of course, and we shouldn't necessarily all aspire to it. There are role players. Uh, my daughter, for example, plays a phenomenal role on her team, and she owns it. She embraces it, but she's not the the one striving to be scoring every goal and, and winning the game just because of her. She puts in her time and effort. She works her tail off, but she's a role player, and that's where she feels she belongs, and she embraces it. So I, I think that's vital that if we look at a team, we can know and be honest with ourselves, where do I fall on this team? Where do I fall in this family? Where do I, where I fall in this friendship group? You know, not competing with each other to play the same role. We say, okay, here's where I belong. Here's what I'm supposed to do. And with that comes, I won't necessarily say less stress, but the proper stress. You know, John and Jess both talked about it before, kind of a good and bad stress. We look at them as good stress is referred to as you stress and quote unquote bad stress is called distress. And technically, even the eustress, if there's an overwhelming amount of it, it can be detrimental. But if we know our role and we're not constantly having these negative thoughts in our head because we don't know where we belong, we don't know what our role is, we're starting to kind of streamline and prioritize where we're going. And that can really help cut down on the, the negative aspect from a mental health perspective that these stressors can have on us. Um, so I'll stop there with mindset for now. Um, and the next step, I want to give a little more actionable work that what we can do with this. And interestingly, to be honest with you, I'm talking quite a bit here, but I, I don't often talk to a screen. I don't talk to the computer and do these Google Meets. I'm, I'm an energetic person. I talk in person with people. And when I do that, I can do it for hours on end, especially when there's a little give and take getting prepared for this. And when John first asked me if I wanted to, I said, you know what? I do, but I'm kind of nervous. So I have to, yes, we're doing it. And it's, I, I look at that. It's hundred percent true. <laughs> I, I was contemplating if I was going to tell it or not, but I had to. Oh, I'm um, glad. Yeah. It's, it's being real, right? That's, this is what stress does. This is what, if we, the way I put it is 
the obstacle is the way this is a book by ryan holiday but just that title really resonates with me and when i have discovered what my path is and i know that this obstacle is on my path then i have to see my way through this even if as i try to get through it i quote unquote fail i have to try it and every time i've taken on a challenge like that on the other side of the challenge i have this sense that my world's getting bigger and when i was younger i would often see that challenge and i would kind of cower away i'd say you know what no i'll pass i'm, I'm okay i don't want to do it and every time i would pass on that obstacle admittedly because of fear my world would get smaller so that concept of finding what your path is, knowing that you're being authentic with that, and then you see that obstacle on your path, find your way through. Go experience it, go take on that challenge. And it might not be a, a win per se, you might not nail it, but that's okay, that doesn't define you. You wanna make sure that you learn from it and you improve from it. So what i did and literally this was up to earlier today as we were getting closer to this one of the strategies that i personally use is breath work and meditation and i had the opportunity to get some time and i, I got a good 35 minute meditation in and i was able to get my breath work going and i could feel my physiological change of the stress that was building up from it because of the unknown I was able to calm myself and prepare myself and get my thoughts flowing a whole lot better. So an actionable way for you guys to do that, and I highly recommend this, it's gonna be something different for you. Most likely I would imagine you're not doing this currently, but it's worth every second of your time. If you can devote five minutes in your morning, five minutes in the evening, preferably literally right when you wake up and then right before you go to bed with your eyes closed, doing some deep diaphragmatic breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing means as we inhale, we fill our belly up like a balloon. As we exhale, we feel that balloon deflate. If we can do that for five consecutive minutes, now preferably with a about a five count inhale and a 10 count exhale. So by prolonging the exhale, we're gonna stimulate our vagus nerve. Stimulating the vagus nerve is gonna stimulate our parasympathetic nervous system that's responsible for rest, relaxation, and digestion. So if we can do these both first thing in the morning and right before we go to bed, we're starting to entrain ourselves in that, in the brain wave length that is actually gonna help create a, a, essentially an overriding of the programming of our subconscious. So a wonderful tool. So we're talking only 10 minutes a day, actionable item. And now you could do that at any point throughout the day as well, and it's still really beneficial. But those are two great times to establish this new norm, this new habit for yourself and be able to really reap the reward and, and the benefit of that breath work. Uh, Jeff, I so think, I that's think that's a suggestion because too often, myself included, we say, you know, there's a lot of great suggestions out there. I just can't find time to do it. But you know what? It's that's part of my language, guys, coaches for the club. But that's crap. <laughs> everybody's got some time in the morning you're laying down in bed and you know what even if you can't do all five minutes right do one minute of it practice yep. start you know, but beginning of the day end of the day we're all laying in bed anyway so it's uh i feel like that's one of those times where it's a great suggestion because there's really minimal excuses you know against it absolutely yeah and that's exactly the idea is just finding a way to make sure we can make it happen and what's great about that strategy is if we just start somewhere we, we find things now I'd rather you do it because you see the value, you want to do it, don't do it because Jeff said this this guy at the, the Google Meet told me to do it, so I'm gonna try it, that it generally doesn't last that way. But if you make that commitment to yourself, what I love to challenge people with is once you make that commitment, make the commitment for 45 days. The reason for 45 days is in 21 days, we can establish a habit. But if we do it consecutively for 45 days, it is cemented in, it is now programmed in our subconscious. You will find yourself doing it without even thinking about it consciously. And it's just something that you do now. And it is amazing what that can do for you. So that's just some real simple breath work. Um, and John, as we were chatting about, I was looking back through the, the text message that got sent to us. I was, this is something else I wanted to share with the breath work is 
in a real life, you know, in game moment when the stress hits and you're playing and you're saying, man, I just made a mistake. I, I meant to pass it over here, but I passed it over there. I messed up. It's, uh, it's another great time to be able to just give yourself that quick little distraction. I think a, a really cool strategy as a team, and you can do it as an individual too, but it's a great way to do it as a team is come up with a word. And it can be a simple, simple word, but it's kind of just that snap you out of it. It can be team. It can be win. Just that a real quick, short syllable, some some word that you can say to yourself or say together as a team to just snap out of that funk, move on from it. Like we talked about, John, the other day is stop saying, I'm sorry. We know you're sorry. We know it was a mistake. Let's just move on. We're here together. Say team, say win, say something together. Come up with your, a word of your own but just move on from that and uh, keep it in the past. So I've rattled off quite a bit, haven't I? I took some um, notes though on your- yeah. Oh, cool. Some, I so so notes, you can add to it. I have some stuff. I, I'll definitely give you that. You say in the notes, I actually took some as you were going as well. So I mentioned this to turn your alone. role. <laughs> Was that? I said, you're not alone. Oh, cheers, cheers. Um, all right, so before I give it back to Jess, I'll just go over these ones real quick. Um, this is a, a, another way to help kind of determine if you're on that right path, if you know what you're supposed to be doing. And this is, you know, of course, this is about soccer specifically, but in life in general, you know, whether you get to a point where you're moving on from soccer or soccer is still a big part of it, but there's other aspects of life going on, sit down with a notepad and Create a list, write down the list of the priorities of the stressors in your life and just get it out, kind of dump it out. Use that journaling um, approach and just put that information down. So a couple of things that came to mind for me is the roles of student, athlete, family member, friend, whatever it is, and, and really hold yourself to that and think about what, what, what each of those is in terms of your priority. So you know where to put your, your efforts. Um, and with that comes setting boundaries. If if this is your priority, don't let somebody pull you away from your priority for their priority because that's a whole nother level of stress that's going to wear you down. And now you're going to have that going on in the back of your mind on a regular basis. And it's really going to help. It's not going to help. It's, it's going to start to get you to kind of break down both mentally and physically and, and take its toll. So... Those are a couple of the notes that I made just while you were going. So I'll pass it back to you now. Okay. Um, I took notes on your three sections, so I'm just going to kind of run down some of it. But with the first one with the fixed first growth mindset, I talk about this probably every single day um, with most of my clients who now are all over the age of um, 21. But it's something that we, it's a skill to learn at the age that you're at that will last forever. Um, and I think one of the things that popped into my head was kind of about, you know, who do you want to be? Is that question that could be hanging over someone, your modeling behavior, who are you modeling for? Do you have your teammates, younger siblings, peers, parents, you know, you have a lot of control on your behavior and you have a lot of control over what you let in and you have a lot of control over how you deal with it. Um, and I think that's the biggest part of the growth first fix. If you're in the fixed mindset, it's, oops, I don't have any impact on that decision. I can't do it any better or any different. And the growth mindset is I have to pivot. I have to change what's just happened to me and I have to roll with it. So I have to figure out how to make it successful with what I have. Um, sometimes this is an injury. Sometimes this is a setback. Sometimes this is, um, you know, a hiccup. And so you do actually have a lot of control. A big reason why people come to therapy is because they want to make changes and making changes means you have control. So most of the time people I say that come have an idea of a growth mindset because they want to figure out how to do something differently um, and not be stuck as we mm -hmm. kind of talk about in our, in my world anyway. Um, okay. Moving on you spent a little bit of time talking about the food and I just want to talk a little bit about how I think that that alone is super stressful. Um, as a person that is an athlete, as a person that could constantly works out, you know, five to seven days a week with two kids, access to healthy food is really difficult 
when we're moving from school to practice to games to tournaments um, to homework. And I think, you know, the age that you're at right now doesn't mean you have a ton of access to preparing that. This is where the teamwork of the family unit or whomever is in your household, um, based on what you're telling them, what works for your body, which sometimes is trial and error, access and convenience is a huge piece. You're at school six to seven hours a day. What are you eating for breakfast? If you are, what's lunch, what's snacks, you know, and then what are we using for that, um, that fuel for any of our actual competition? Um, but if we don't have that stuff prepared, if it's not consistent, it's going to be a stressor. And that's one thing that you can do and take control over to make sure that that does not become stressful. And Jeff, I actually am going to go to this training. It's anti-inflammatory lifestyle. So it's funny that you brought it up. Um, but it's kind of all about that gut, you know, that, that connection in terms of, um, anxiety, depression and how that, that gut issue really connects to anxiety and depression, which sometimes feels like it, it is out of our control, but there's so Mm -hmm. much research that talks about our food and our intake. Um, so if you can start with some small changes, like having an apple, having a banana, having some vegetables, having some nuts, just simple things that might be really, um, accessible to keep in a bag or in the car, um, packing something that can stay in the car, like a cooler that's just there. Um, these are really, really actionable ways to make sure that you're not having a barrier to healthy choices. So I wanted to Mm -hmm. just talk about that too, because I think that can be really, really stressful for people a lot of times, especially teens when they just are not responsible for the grocery shopping and or the list making um, and sometimes where they're able to go for it. Um, Okay. Jess. Yes. One second. Uh, And for the club, I'm not sure if I spoke about this last time, the last lecture, but in that same vein, You know, I know that there's a lot of research coming out now showing that um, really drastic changes and inconsistency in youth athlete diets, as well as large gaps in between their major meals. We're talking longer than two to three hours in between main meals leads to a much higher incidence of uh, overuse injuries, tendon injuries, tendonitis and things like that. So it's more so than just, you know, yeah, I know I have to eat more because I have to eat more calories and calories out. Um, you know, you guys have talked about how it affects the body. We're talking about hormonal changes, you know, gut health. Um, you know, it all starts, you know, from the inside out. And when we're talking about athletes, you know, people want to say, how can I perform better? Well, one of the most important ways to perform better is to stay as healthy as possible and not get injured. And if it starts with, like you're saying, something in your control, you know, minimizing overuse injuries, like how many of you youth athletes have had knee pain as a soccer player? I don't know if I have enough hands to raise for that, you know, Um, you know, shoulder injuries, you know, ankle injuries, things like that, hip pain, all those little nagging things. Well, guess what? You know, poor diet can uh, can affect that as well. Um, And I will say I'll come down a little harder on this angle where it comes down to accountability. Jay, you and I have talked about this at your age. You don't some of you may not be driving yet. You may not be doing the food shopping, but you guys definitely are in charge of your own schedule. You are the owner of your own schedule, your own day. And accountability is a large part of this. You can plan better. You can say, yes, I look at my schedule in school. I need to plan my snacks. I need to um, take ownership of, you know, these things. And if I want to be a high level athlete, youth athlete, well, the opportunity cost is I may have to sacrifice some other things in order to do that. And that's not a bad thing. It's just Sometimes that means sacrificing a little bit of extra time, five, 10 minutes to plan your day better, you know, or plan your week better and, and think a few steps ahead like chess. So um, I don't want to keep going on, but it's it's really important topic. Absolutely. And in, in my world anyway, there is a, a phrase that's called food equals mood. And hmm. so there is a component there where we talk about the joke of people being hangry or, you know, there, there's hormones that are impacted when we're not eating enough or as frequently as we should. And to your point about the timing and Jeff about kind of this meditation piece, um, I'm a big believer in kind of like setting your intentions for the day. So even when you wake Mm -hmm. up, if you can just roll through that in your head of like, what do I want to accomplish today? Do you write it down? Do you just speak it out loud? You know, what do I have to do? Do I have a test? Do I I have practice? You know, am I going to see friends? Like, what is it that you want to accomplish? Um, And I think being able to kind of again, know that you have control over how this is going to go. And to Jeff's point, there's some really great apps that I do recommend for a lot of my clients. Um, Headspace is one, which is, you know, um, a meditative app that's 
kind of a coaching app as well. Calm is another one that's guided meditation. Um, and a relatively new one that I've been using is Think Ladder, which is a, um, it's kind of like a cognitive coaching app. So it's really about mindset. And it's basically challenging the mindset. And it's just really simple. You go through and you click the different thoughts that might be in there and it directs you to something else. And it kind of leads you down this or up this ladder. Um, and it's with you all the time. I mean, we always have our phones with us. So there is no excuse to have access to these things. A bus ride, um, a car ride to or from practice is a great time to practice some of this meditation if you have headphones. So there are, again, some ways that you can really control some of this stuff. I know at night, it's also really hard for people's wheels to turn off to come down from the day for your body and your minds to shut down and get ready to relax. Um, so these um, meditative apps, I think, are really great for that time. And then one last thing that I just had some thoughts on is kind of this idea of, you know, if any of you are looking to play at the collegiate level or maybe um, professional down the line, you know, what coaches for looking for have been having a lot of these conversations and reading about this a lot. And although your skill is so important, they are not only looking for your skill. They're looking at how you fail. They're looking at how you're a teammate. They're looking at how you handle yourself. They're looking at your accountability. So your skills are great, and that's what you're practicing every single day when you're at practice or when you're at your games. But the things you're doing off the field are going to be what are more important in the long run and what will carry over to life post-soccer. And so as much as I know this is about soccer, I do care about you guys being like really good humans and how we're going to set you up for success down the line. And I you're think e you're legally obligated to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I just think those are some things that I would say that remember going back to that fix versus growth. It's like you're modeling this. What people see is what you have control over. So how you are a teammate, how you're cheering people on if you get taken out of the game, how you do deal with the fact that you made the wrong pass. Like, this is what people are watching. This is what people want to see. They want to see how you talk to yourself. They want to see how you talk to other people. They want to see how you handle failure. These are really, really great strategies. And like Jeff said too, I mean, we could go on and talk about this for hours and hours and hours, which is what I do all day long. But, you know, we have limited time. So I think they're just some tiny, tiny thoughts on the, some of the bigger topics, um, but things that we're very passionate about and things I think um, matter on the soccer field and also off the soccer field in the classroom with your friends and family. Um, these are just some small tidbits and strategies to think about um, in life. Yeah. I think those are two great points to to kind of end with Jess and bring a full circle, right? Is it's okay to fail, but also from a mental fortitude standpoint, are you going to be a liability on the field, in the locker room, you know, all, you know, away from the team? You know, are you being an asset to the team? Jay, I know we've talked about that, right? People think it's funny to talk about youth athletes as assets, but when you're competing at a high level, you have to be an asset on the team. Like Jeff said, what role are you playing? What are you envisioning? So, um, you know, guys, I, you're awesome. <laughs> this this was awesome tonight. I, I got a lot out of it too. Um, and there were common themes there between goal setting, journaling, um, you know, being a, how do you be a better teammate for yourself? You know, that's immediately what I thought of when, when Jess was talking initially. You guys, not only can you help yourselves, but as teammates, talk to your peers. Set, you know, at the beginning of the season or a couple times a year, sit down with one another, talk about, you know, how it's going for one another and recognize each other's stress signs if you're with each other a lot you're going to know each other you're going to know when somebody's not acting like themselves whether it's you know in school or is your mood off is it is this a one-off data point or hey you know what you know sally's been off you know for like a week now like i wonder if anything's going on or what's going on with johnny you know he's not like, like himself you know um talk to each other like jeff said come up with a buzzword on the field snap yourselves out of it um you know but these are these are things that you know I did when I was younger without even knowing what some of my teammates, not even for soccer, it was more for track, um, how to psych each other up, how to snap each other out of the, you know, the, uh, the yips, so to speak, you know, when it, when it comes time to, to performing, but, um, this was great guys. Uh, I, I got nothing else to add. It's, it's been a long night, a lot for everybody to digest. The three of us can talk, uh, <laughs> But it is. It's because we, we love this stuff and we've all been there. I think there's a small part of us, each of the three of us that say, man, if only I had known this when I was playing, you know, how much better would it have been? Um, you know, but that's that's why we can live vicariously through you guys. When we see when we see Manhattan Soccer Club successful, we're like, 
I had a small part to do with that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah. we, we really do appreciate your time. Jeff, Jess, you, you guys are rock stars. Um, you know, I really feel that way. So, yeah, I want to say uh, thank you to everybody. Um, you know, just touching upon the um, uh, the idea of managing or preparing for when things don't go right. We, we were just talking as a team the other day about uh, everybody trains for success, but rarely do people train for failure. And, and meaning that it's, you know, how do you react when things aren't going well? And how can you manage to get it back on track? Uh, or how do you manage to have it not affect you less? You know, mm-hmm. and I think that that's, that's something that, that not everybody thinks about all the time. Um, and then uh, one of the one of the gems that I picked up along the way in, in my journey was, you know, write down on an index card what you feel your mentality should be, your outlook should be when you approach a match or training. Take that index card and put it in your cleat. And every time you go to put it in your cleat, it'll probably poke you in the foot. And then you look in, hey, what's what's poking me in the foot? And you pull this index card out, and it's you coaching yourself in that Mm -hmm. statement. And it's kind of like some Tim Robbins kind of stuff, you know. Uh, But uh, but I I I found that it it works for a lot of people to do it. And um, and you know, you just always replace it after the game. You put it back in your cleat. So anyway, uh, I I can't thank you guys enough. There's so many great things that. Uh, Cheryl and I are just sitting there nodding our head, like, you know, stuff that we, that, that we agree with things that we picked up and learned tonight. Um, just so many great things. And then we're saying like, you know what, let's go in the house and let's, let's try that. Like right now, you know, I'm, I'm ready to start on my breathing tonight, you know? So, um, you know, so I appreciate that Yoda. That, that was good. That was good feedback. Jeff, Jeff is happy to help anybody do it at five o'clock in the morning in a uh, cold plunge. So, yeah. <laughs> so four o'clock. Yeah. Well, oh, four o'clock. <laughs> sorry. Did anyone, anyone listening, have any questions from the group? I mean, you could put them in the chat or quickly because yeah. I know everybody needs to get to to bed. But if any of the players or parents on, <clears throat> it was a lot that to make, digest. That's a lot there. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. But seriously, Jay, Jay, like you said, it's okay to fail. It yeah. really is okay to fail. Jeff, you and I were talking. Um, and yeah, what happens when you're not? Like we all, everybody wants to be the hero. Everybody wants to be the star. Everybody wants to be the next, I'm going to go date myself, but the next Mia Ham, right? Or, you yeah. know, Aldo or Messi. But, you know, what happens when you don't? Like, are you are you going to be okay with that? And that's where I think goal setting comes in. Jay, you said, you know, when you, you know, what happens when you don't fail? I do this for business over the past 10 years, you know, you know, growing our clinic, one of the first of its kind, we, we had no roadmap for this. And it was like, okay, well, this is the goal, That's right. but then what are your actionable things to get there? And what happens if we don't reach it? You know, what should we change and modify? And it's, yeah. you, know, you, you don't have time to panic. And in a game with 90 minutes and things happen like that, you don't have time to panic. Yeah. And, so. and Johnny, you got, you got a good sense of uh, what we do and what we've achieved with the men's team at Monroe. Um, and uh, a lot of what we do there that with the cognitive processing is that we actually train to for cognitive overloads so that that we will fail. You know, like it's inevitable that we're going to fail at some point because mental fatigue sets in and then mistakes occur. And in that moment, we laugh and enjoy the moment. You know, we make it a positive moment. Um, and it, it's very different from let's say the typical American learning systems in the classroom where it's like either study memorization, you test, you fail, you feel ashamed, you go again. You know, it's, it's the opposite of that. It's let's push and break thresholds and enjoy the challenge in the fact that when we do, uh, when we don't find the success that it's an enjoyable thing because we've learned something about ourselves and now we're challenged to go again and push that threshold farther you know and and we we do that from the most simplest tasks in the club right now to uh at the youngest age groups to the oldest age group so yeah we're all thinking the same way and it's pretty exciting to find find a tribe of people that uh are approaching it but but from different angles so Mm -hmm. um we can't thank you enough jessica jeff you guys are amazing john 
thank you so much. You know, uh, uh, we really just appreciate you guys taking the time to share your knowledge with us. And, um, you know, I'm sure people are going to walk away from this uh, with, if not, uh, you know, one or two things, you know, a, a couple of things that can really help them. So thank you so much. We're very grateful. Oh, great. Thank, thank you, thank you guys for having us. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you.